Hi, I'm David Bonsack, Product Manager for Rheology at TA Instruments. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. If you get disconnected at any time, please use the instructions you receive to log back in. You can access various content by clicking the Documents widget at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. This includes speaker bios and additional file downloads. If you need help at any time, click the question mark widget. Please ask any questions you may have at any time during the presentation by submitting them through the Q&A window. We will answer as many of these as possible at the end of the webinar. Our guest speaker today is Professor Joao Maia of the Case Western Reserve University Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering. Professor Maia is the director of the Center of Advanced Polymer Processing and conducts active research in rheology and polymer processing with an emphasis on the development of new multi-phase polymeric materials, online sensing of extrusion and compounding, viscoelasticity of multi-phase materials, and extensional rheology. Professor Maya received his PhD from the University of Wales Aberystwyth under the supervision of Professor Ken Walters and was previously on the faculty at the University of Minho, Portugal. Joao has published more than 300 scientific works, including eight patents and more than 80 papers. He was a Fulbright Fellow in 2007, received the annual award of the British Society of Rheology and the Moore and Lambla Award of the Polymer Processing Society. It's truly a pleasure to have Professor Maya with us today. The title of his talk is The Role of Interfacial Elasticity on the Rheological Behavior of Polymer Blends. Well, thank you for the introduction, David. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second webinar on the role of extensional rheology uh, in the polymer processing world and on the uh, development of new uh, polymer-based materials. Uh, the title of this uh, second webinar is The Role of Interfacial Elasticity on the rheological behavior of polymer blends. And what we're going to do here is show how to, under, in order to understand the really complex behavior that these multi-phase materials show, uh, we need to um, integrate shear rheology with extensional rheology with other techniques like light scattering and microscopy. Okay? So in the first webinar, we saw what the uh, relevance of extensional flow was in real uh, life applications. Uh, the first webinar in particular was devoted to the role of extensional rheology uh, uh, in polymer processing. Uh, but um, as I hinted uh, at the time, uh, extensional rheology is actually a really, really important and interesting characterization tool um, and to probe structure of these more complex materials. So, for example, uh, whereas in shear flows, uh, the uh, cross-section of the flow, so if you imagine flow between two parallel plates, the cross-section is always the same. Any new surface that's generated is uh, generated just by the deformation of this interface, for example. So there is some surface generation, but not much. If you have an extensional deformation, now you start off with a certain volume, you stretch that volume, you generate a lot of area compared to the uh, volume, which remains constant. In fact, the creation of area is exponential, as we saw last time. So if we're dealing with multi-component systems or multi-phase systems, like polymer blends, like emulsions, like polymer nanocomposites, it's extensional flows are much more efficient at uh, inducing morphologies than shear flows are. And not only are they more uh, effective or efficient at inducing morphologies, they're also, the uh, materials also respond differently when uh, prodded rheologically in an extensional flow, it ends up being more sensitive to changes, for example, in molecular weights, molecular weights distributions. Uh, degrees of branching and so forth and so forth. So that's what we're going to, talk in a, to be talking about today. And the case study that we're going to use today is one of the most important in uh, the uh, polymer processing world, the case of polymer blends. Um, the idea of polymer blends obviously is to blend uh, two polymers with different um, 
char characteristics and behaviors and uh, get a third um, or get a, another material with uh, a synergistic behavior in, um, yeah. in operation. So it's like, uh, for example, at home, um, when we cook, uh, we have ingredients, we have seasonings, we have uh, a cooking vessel, an oven, a microwave oven, a toaster, anything. Um, and then we have a recipe that involves time, temperature, pressure, and mixing, right? In the end, we hope we get a synergistic effect and that our meal is going to be better and uh, taste better than the original ingredients. Same thing exactly with polymers. We are, we want, we just have polymers and additives for uh, ingredients and seasonings. We normally use a twin screw extruder as our cooking vessel, but then there's a recipe that involves time, temperature, pressure, and mixing. So uh, in a way, uh, uh, when we develop these polymer blends, what we're doing is our polymeric cooking. We're trying to develop materials on the cheap, but with enhanced properties. So two things uh, need to happen when uh, we process uh, polymer blends. First, we need to generate interface, right? And then we have phase A, phase B, the only way to improve properties really is to make things happen across that interface. Um, so for example, a, a case that is not polymer blends but everybody is familiar with is water and oil. Water and oil, you can mix them, you can mix them tremendously well, as fast as you can. The moment you stop, they phase separate and you end up with a two-phase system. If you add egg yolk, for example, now this egg yolk will stabilize the interface of the oil droplets and you end up with mayonnaise. Ergo, you started with two completely, with, in this case with three materials and you got something completely different out of them just by creating interface and the proper interactions across that interface. All right, so um, what I just did to the uh, water and oil emulsion uh, by adding the egg yolk was to compatibilize the water and the oil. And we do the same thing with polymers. Um, most polymers are the uh, uh, polymer uh, melt equivalent of water and oil. Polymers tend to be very asocial or antisocial, especially with other polymers. Uh, so when you blend them, they tend to phase separate and we tend not to get the properties we want. So what we need to do then is compatibilize them. How do we do that? There are different uh, strategies. Um, the four most uh, uh, common ones are uh, addition of a pre-made grafted or block copolymer, in situ formation of that copolymer, um, introduction of specific interactions or, for example, monomers. So in the first case, uh, we have polymer A, we have polymer B, and we add an, a certain amount of an AB copolymer. The A tail, uh, the A head of this copolymer will go to the A phase, the B will go to the B phase, and hence you have a stabilized morphology. That's pretty much what you have here in this slide. Uh, you can have simple dye block copolymers or uh, more uh, complex grafted copolymers, but the idea, uh, I think, is pretty clear. In the second way of compatibilizing uh, these blends is instead of uh, adding a third element, we create that third element in, during processing. So for example, in this case, we have um, a phase A, which has a reactive group A star, or uh, sorry, X. Uh, we have another B, which has a reactive group Y, and we make X uh, and Y uh, react. Uh, the advantages here, so now we have a, a, a copolymer that's generated in situ, um, chemically in situ in the extruder. Uh, so the advantages are typically that the, uh, this block or grafted co co copolymer is generated at the interface where, it, where, where it's exactly where we want it, right? The interface is exactly where we want these things. Uh, the drawbacks, 
The reactions take primarily take place primarily at the interfaces, so it's slightly more difficult to control, for example, the rate of formation, the amount, and the molecular architecture of the compatibilizer. So there are advantages and disadvantages. In other cases, we may not have the possibility or we may not want to do this chemistry or this compatibilization. In that case, we can play around with specific interactions uh, that will result in the decrease of the so-called Gibbs energy of mixing, thereby making the materials more, um, uh, more compatible. Um, a typical case is, uh, for example, slightly modifying one of the polymers to uh, uh, induce uh, more hydrogen bonding in the system. So um, that's the specific interactions. And then there's another strategy um, with the addition of ionomers. This is becoming uh, more popular uh, because it makes for reversibility. So for example, here what we, uh, what we do normally is we introduce uh, these ionomers, typically sulfonic acid or carboxylic acid, uh, into the polymer chains via copolymerization, for, for example. And then what happens is that the, these ionomers, they will tend to aggregate in clusters, okay? Uh, and uh, in multiplets, sorry. And at high enough concentrations, these multiplets will aggregate and form clusters. And so they will act as physical crosslinks. The cool thing here is that these are reversible because normally then when we raise the temperature again to melt processing, to melt processing temperature, we break uh, these uh, links and, um, which then reform when you cool them down again. So for, for example, this is a, a, a strategy that can be used when one wants to make recyclable polymer blends because then when we recycle the material, we reheat it, we break up the, the uh, structure, which can then reform uh, again with other uh, components. So these are typically the four main uh, uh, compatibilization techniques or strategies. Um, these give rise to a whole host of uh, morphologies, right? Big range of morphologies. Um, the most common morphology, and the only one we're going to be talking about today, is the so-called uh, droplet, uh, droplet matrix morphology. In this case, we have a matrix, which is a continuous phase, and uh, we have a uh, smaller component, a smaller volume component, which we call the dispersed phase. And as you can see here in this slide, um, if we do our job correctly, we will have um, this dispersed phase finely dispersed into very small droplets that are uniformly distributed uh, throughout the matrix. Uh, the, the trick is how to achieve this and how to stabilize it. So going back to the water and oil example, how do we keep these little droplets from all coalescing into one big droplet of the dispersed phase? But that's typically what we want. All right, so moving ahead. Um, we normally, when we talk about uh, polymer blends, the, um, one of the most important uh, diagrams that we talk about is the so-called grace plot that you see here in this uh, slide. So in the x-axis, you have something called the capillary number, which I'll explain in a minute, and in the, sorry, in the y-axis, and in the x-axis, you have the viscosity ratio, the viscosity ratio being defined as the viscosity of the dispersed phase, what will become the droplets, um, divided by the viscosity of the matrix. Um, so viscosity ratio above one means more viscous droplets, a viscosity ratio below one means a more viscous matrix. Um, now, what is the capillary number? The capillary number is extremely important when you were breaking up the droplets and generating this, this morphology. The capillary number is basically a ratio of the shear stresses, uh, which are given by the shear rate times the uh, viscosity of the matrix, as you can see there, divided by the interfacial stresses which are the interfacial tension alpha divided by the radius of the uh, uh, droplet. So basically what, the cap what these two forces will do is they will have uh, opposite effects. The shear forces will want to tear the uh, um, droplet apart, whereas the interfacial stresses will try to keep 
the droplet together. So it's between the balance of these two uh, that, uh, and, and depending on who wins, uh, on, on which one wins, that uh, we get the different morphologies. And then what this plot shows us, the capillary number, uh, the grace plot, is that the capillary number needs to be above a certain critical value to be able to, to for the shear stresses, to be able to uh, break up the uh, droplets. And one thing you will notice is that at high viscosity ratios, typically above four, um, applying a simple shear flow will have no effect on droplet breakup because there's a, there's a vertical asymptote there, meaning that no matter how fast you shear, oh, sorry, no matter, no matter how, how fast you shear the uh, droplets, if the viscosity ratio is typically higher than four or five, you won't be able to break them by the action of shear alone. That's where extension comes in. Okay, so um, now we have the two blends and the grace plot was uh, developed for what we call immiscible blends, like the water and oil, okay? Um, now when we compatibilize blends, the whole thing re uh, goes to a new level of complexity because now we have the, in the interface to deal with, not only the interface, but also the interactions across the interface. And so the big question we want to ask is the one you see uh, on the screen. What is the effect of the nature and strength of this interface um, on the rheological and morphological, and you, could see, and you could say mechanical properties of these blends? That's what we're gonna try and answer. Okay, so let's begin with a typical uh, commercial blend. This is uh, the type of system that is commonly found in industry, and this is a blend of a nylon, of nylon, in this case PA6, with an EPM rubber. The idea here is to, for the uh, rubber, to act as an impact modifier to increase the impact resistance of the polyamide of the nylon. Good idea difficult to execute because these two uh, uh, polymers are immiscible. So typically what we have to do is go to one of those four techniques. In this case, it's called in situ compatibilization. What we do is uh, in, um, instead of using regular EPM rubber, um, we use an EPM rubber with a malic anhydride group grafted onto it, okay? And then what happens is that this, um, Mal these malic anhydride groups will react with the, amine, the uh, amine groups of the PA6. And you will have a copolymer that's formed via this reaction, okay? We normally do this in a twin screw extruder, obviously, we, because that's our cooking vessel. All right, so um, what's the influence of adding this grafted, this modified, uh, EPM to the blend. Well, all right, let's see here. These are, the, um, um, these are the components and the processing conditions. Basically, we use the co-rotating and intermeshing co-rotating twin screw extruder, as people would, would use uh, in industry. Um, and then we tested six blends. And the code for, the, for those blends are, is uh, shown in that table. Basically, the first number uh, is kept constant at 80 uh, is the weight percentage of the polyamide 6, which is the matrix, the continuous matrix. The EPM, the portion of the EP of the unmodified rubber, rep uh, de depicted there as EPM, uh, is the second value. And that goes from a maximum of 20% to a minimum of zero. And the third represents the amount of this modified rubber, this reactive rubber that we add. And obviously it goes from zero to 20. So we go from a fully immiscible blend, which is the 80-20-0, to a fully compatibilized blend, which is the 80-0-20, and everything in between. Okay, so that's what we're gonna look at. First thing we do is obviously we take the uh, materials and we look, uh, in, a, uh, in an electron microscope at the size of the droplet. And as you can see there, we plot the radius of those droplets uh, as a function of percentage 
of uh, modified rubber. And when we have no modified rubber, we have um, a, radius, a, a radius of typically 15 to 20 microns. By adding the compatibilized rubber, the uh, reactive rubber, this decreases a lot. And by the time we only have compatibilized rubber in the system, the average droplet size is uh, less than a micron, which is great because now, as I said, remember, we, when we blend materials, we want to do two things. We want to generate interface, and we want to make stuff happen across that interface. So now here is a case where we generated a lot of interface. The amount of non-nylon material, the amount of rubber is always the same, but the very finely dispersed uh, blend has a lot more surface area than the uh, uh, non-modified or then the miscible blend. So this, if nothing else, adding this uh, rubber, this modified rubber actually helped at least to generate a lot of interface. Again, not only that, but it, they will actually compatibilize and improve the properties as well and stabilize the morphology, but uh, there you go. So that's the first thing. So things are uh, uh, behaving the way we expected them to. Okay, so then we can uh, perform some, uh, we can start looking at the nature of this interface, trying to study the nature of this interface. And the first thing everybody always does, obviously, is look at the shear behavior of these uh, materials. In particular, the behavior in small amplitude oscillatory shear. So we put the materials between two plates and we just oscillate one of them. We oscillate it uh, at a low enough amplitude uh, as, so, as not to destroy the structure that's in there. Uh, so what we call the linear viscoelastic regime. And then we take a look at the corresponding uh, response of the material and uh, go from there. So here what I show you is the elastic response of the material, the elasticity of the material in the form of G prime or the storage modulus or elastic modulus, okay? So this G prime basically gives you the elasticity of the material. And what we can see is that uh, obviously the uh, more elastic material of all is the EPM, the base EPM, the black stars, followed by the black and white inverted triangles, which is just the modified rubber. Now, obviously, th there is less elasticity there because now we don't have a perfect rubber. We have these malic anhydride groups grafted uh, along the chains, so obviously the elasticity is slightly lower. Uh, the uh, full triangles, which are essentially at the uh, uh, bottom of all those curves, uh, is the response of the uh, polyamide 6 of the nylon. And then we have uh, these figures are... Uh, a little bit polluted visually, but, um, uh, but it's necessary to, uh, to uh, look at these things. Uh, and then what do we have? We have in green the result for the um, emissible blend, uh, and then the crosses and the white diamonds are for the, and the uh, uh, red diamonds are for the compatibilized blends. And what we see is that at, low fr at high frequencies, um, we have a behavior that is not really predicted by the rheological models, um, and uh, it's probably caused by interfacial slip between the two phases because you're oscillating so fast that, uh, especially in the um, emissible blends uh, the, or the weakly compatibilized blends, you might have some slip between the two phases. But that's, uh, that's more an academic um, curiosity than uh, anything else, so we won't pay that much attention to uh, uh, that behavior at high frequencies uh, so much. Uh, at low frequencies, this is the long-term behavior. Low frequencies means long times, so we're actually looking at the relaxation of these uh, materials. So, and what we see is that G prime, the elasticity, increases with increasing compatibilizer content, which is good because G prime is the elasticity. So that means that we have more elastic materials as we add more and more compatibilizer. Now, the green uh, dots are above the others, but they're not really comparable. Uh, we're not comparing apples to apples in that case because, as we saw before, the actual droplet size is completely different. So th those results are not directly comparable. Okay, so this is the first piece of the puzzle. 
The uh, second piece of the puzzle is to actually look at uh, elasticity is to perform what we call stress relaxation experiments, still in steady shear. Here what we do, again, we have the samples between the two um, plates. We uh, rotate as quickly as possible, ideally instantaneously, but there is no such thing, obviously. Um, but as quickly as possible, we apply a certain deformation to the sample, and then we watch the, how the stress is relaxed over time. Uh, and what we have there is that the normalized stresses, so the stress normalized by the, its initial value, um, as they relax over time. And um, let me guide you through this, uh, uh, this slide again. Um, we don't, uh, so the EPM, the base rubber, as you can see, it's elastic. So there is almost no stress relaxation even after almost two minutes uh, upon cessation of the deformation. So this is a pure rubber. You, you, we, you've all seen this. If you take a rubber band, stretch it, you keep it stretched until tomorrow morning, you'll still feel the same recovery force. So this is what happens, all right? So you have a very highly elastic melt. Um, then you have the modified rubber, which is slightly less elastic, as we already uh, saw before. And then we have the uh, polyamide 6. The polyamide 6, again, are the uh, black uh, uh, upward pointing triangles. And we can see that uh, pretty much after 10 seconds, all the stresses that uh, were imposed on the sample by this deformation have been relaxed. So we can say approximately that the longest relaxation time of this material is of the order of 10 seconds. And then we have an intermediate behavior. And one thing is very clear if you look at those, um, uh, at, at those curves is that there is a two-step relaxation. There is an initial relaxation that follows the relaxation of the matrix, which is what we expect to happen. So the matrix is the low elasticity component, so it relaxes faster, and we get the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, a relaxation of the stresses in the system that in the blend that pretty much follows that line. But then after a while, the elastic stresses in the dispersed phase uh, kick in. So instead of the, uh, of the relaxation curve following the, curve, the relaxation curve of the, uh, of the uh, um, matrix all the way, it doesn't. There is a second step that uh, initially one could be excused uh, uh, thinking that it's due to the relaxation of the, uh, matri of, of the elastic phase. Okay, but clearly there are these two, re two relaxation mechanisms. But there's more to the story than just this. Um, we also stretch, if you remember, uh, extensional flows uh, are uh, better to study in principle, they're better to uh, study uh, the uh, interface in these blends. So we stretched our, uh, our blends. We put them in, a, in, in an extensional rheometer and we deformed them. Here we have some um, scanning electron micrographs, so basically some um, micron scale photographies uh, of the uh, blends. And we have in the, in the top row the 80-20-0 that is the emissible blend in the bottom row, the 80020. And we have micrographs here before and after extension. So if you, if you go to the emissible blend to the 8020, you will see that uh, there is almost no deformation of the dispersed phase, the, the, the holes and the uh, 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 droplets in there, okay? And we're not surprised because we're stretching the sample but we're stretching essentially the matrix because there is no interaction, there's no adhesion between the matrix and the uh, rubber. The rubber hardly feels anything. Basically, there's some slip between the, the two phases. However, if we start with the, um, if we go to the compatibilized blend, now we have initially, as we saw before, a much, much finer morphology, much smaller droplets. But then after that formation, you see that those droplets, those holes, they're elongated. And that means that there was really some stress transfer from the matrix to the droplets as we stretch them, okay? And we've actually developed in my group this technique called stress relaxation after a step elongation. And so basically what we do is the, um, 
um, equivalent, uh, the extensional equivalent of the stress relaxation experiment, but now we do it in a step strain. So basically we take the sample and we stretch it very quickly up to a, a certain deformation and watch or measure how the stress is relaxed over time. And again, you see there the normalized tensile stress decaying. Uh, I've represented less, um, uh, less materials here for just for uh, clarity. And we'll see that um, the actual deformation takes about half a second, uh, sorry, uh, five hundredths of a second to be imposed. And that's the, ups the uptick, the, in the initial uptick, okay? And then things start relaxing. And what we see is that the polyamide, which is, again, the black triangles, and the immiscible blend relax have exactly the same relaxation kinetics. That means that basically, con it, so this confirms what we saw in the micrographs. We're not deforming the rubber at all. We're just uh, deforming the matrix. However, if we add 15 or 20 percent of the uh, compatibilized phase now, we have a very, very pronounced second step, a long-term relaxation, um, okay, which is uh, very interesting. So, but now the question is, how much of this contribution, how much of this second step is due just to the presence of a rubber phase, and how much is it due to the actual nature of the interface? Okay, so, um, we had to go to, to uh, study that, we had to go to uh, uh, other systems. Uh, in this case, uh, blends of uh, polymethyl met uh, metacrylate, PMMA, and polystyrene, PS. And uh, again, like before, so the advantage of these materials is that they're optically transparent, they're amorphous polymers, they're optically transparent, so we can do light scattering studies on them. Uh, you'll see the results later. Um, and now, how do we compat these are also incompatible materials, immiscible materials. How do we compatibilize them? Well, uh, we go to one of the other uh, techniques, the introduction of specific interactions. So we have uh, some of the polystyrene re uh, uh, replaced with uh, polystyrene that's functionalized by this oxazoline group, okay? And the idea is that this oxazoline group will create um, uh, some hydrogen bridges with the uh, PMMA. Um, so this is a physical compatibilization. For example, if we run infrared spectra on these two samples, they have the same peaks at the same wavelengths. So uh, there is no chemical modification in these, unlike the previous ones. However, if we measure the interfacial tension, we'll see that the uh, immiscible blend, the PMMA-PS, has uh, an interfacial tension of about 3.5 millinewton per meter, and the, the blend, the compatibilized blend, has an interfacial tension of about 3 uh, millinewton per meter, which is about 20% lower, indicating that there is a really some compatibilization. So we're decreasing that interfacial tension. Okay? All right. So... We know that there is some compatibilization and it's physical compatibilization, probably hydrogen bonding, go, uh, uh, some uh, hydrogen bonding going on. But um, there you go. So again, we do the same thing. We put them uh, in a processing machine. In this case, it's just a batch mixer, not an extruder. Um, but we follow exactly the same procedure. 80% of the uh, matrix, 20% of the dispersed phase, and this can uh, vary between 20-0, which means no modified polystyrene, so the immiscible blend, uh, to 0-20, which means only modified polystyrene, and a number of the others in between. Now, for this light scattering studies that I will show you later, we have to avoid what we call multiple diffraction, so we need to use very dilute. In that case, we use just 1% uh, concentrations. Uh, so we had two uh, um, samples. We had two materials, one with just 1% of the regular polystyrene and another with only 1% of the modified polystyrene. But for, the, for all the processing studies, we used 80-20 um, blends. 
Now, one interesting thing here now is uh, the compatibilization is physical, it's not chemical, and what you see is that there really isn't much of a difference in droplet size between the compatibilized and the non-compatibilized blend. Um, what, uh, the, so what the compatibilization is doing in this case is not so much decreasing the droplet size, but it's just stabilizing the uh, interface, avoiding that these droplets will coalesce. All right, so uh, if you remember going back to the uh, uh, Grace plot, we had the viscosity ratios, and what the Grace plot showed, even though I didn't point it, is that there's an optimal viscosity ratio of about one for droplet breakup. And above four, five, it basically become, becomes impossible. So um, here we have the uh, viscosity of the uh, two blends, uh, the complex viscosity of the two blends, and at typical shear rates of processing, which is about, are about 80 to 100 reciprocal seconds, we'll see that the um, uh, viscosity ratios are always above one, but they're relatively close to one, uh, which explains why the two blends have similar morphologies, because we are in that region th where um, droplet breakup is optimized, okay? So that's, uh, that's good, that, that explains it. So now this is a very uh, busy slide. I'll just go, uh, just focus on the main characteristics of it. So basically what we see there is the uh, black diamonds, we have the PMMA, which is the, the matrix, okay? Then followed by the uh, black upward pointing triangles, which is the polystyrene and the black circles, which is the modified polystyrene. And again, as we see, as we modify the polystyrene, we decrease elasticity just like before with the EPM rubber. So exactly the same type of behavior. But what we see now is that these compatibilized blends, especially I call your attention to the seven and a half, 10 and 20% compatibilized blends, they have a distinct plateau at very, very low shear rates, okay? This, this means that we are increasing the elasticity of these blends tremendously uh, when we compare them with, for example, the green curve, which represents the non uh, or the miscible blend. So really, we are having some serious compatibilization here, and uh, we have, uh, so that uh, uh, plateau is a, a very well-known consequence of having a, a blend here with a very fine uh, morphology. So good, excellent. So we know what we have. So now let's go to the steady, to, to the uh, stress relaxation, both after uh, steady shear and extension. So what we have there now, again, the material that relaxes the faster, uh, the fastest, in this case, even less than a second, very, very little elasticity. Uh, the PMMA, I mean, after, um, after about six, seven tenths of a second, the stress has basically decreased to nothing. So very small relaxation time. Even the um, polystyrene and the modified polystyrene have uh, relatively short uh, relaxation times. Two seconds versus five, six seconds. And then we have a very intriguing behavior. So we're stretching these samples, we're, sorry, we're deforming these samples in a rotational rheometer at a certain shear rate of 0 0.1 reciprocal seconds for 20, 250 seconds. So we're deforming these things by 25 strain units, uh, which we did very uh, under controlled conditions in an IRS rheometer. And um, as you will see, the blends are slower to relax than the two uh, than, than the three polymers. So we cannot just attribute this second, uh, the, the, this second uh, relaxation mechanism, this shoulder, this, check, this second shoulder, just to the relaxation of the uh, dispersed phase. In the previous case, because the dispersed phase was highly elastic, was essentially a rubber, and the relaxation times were so long, we couldn't tell what was relaxation of the dispersed phase and what was relaxation of the interface. Here, 
we have um, three materials, uh, one, poly, one PMMA and two polystyrenes, that have relatively low elasticity, all of them. But nonetheless, the blend is highly elastic. It takes a long time to, to, uh, to uh, relax. And obviously, what does that mean? If it's not the PMMA, if it's not from one of the polystyrenes, there's only one possibility. It's from the interface. So clearly, this interface is more elastic. Whatever type of compatibilization is happening is much more elastic than either of the two components. All right? And uh, what we also see um, is that as we increase the amount of compatibilized polystyrene, this relaxation behavior becomes slower and slower. The relaxation time becomes longer and longer. So the, the uh, green curve, which shows uh, 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 the result for the immiscible blend, now, again, so uh, now, uh, before, if you remember, we weren't deforming the rubber phase because the difference in viscosities were so high. But now the viscosities are relatively similar. The viscosity ratio is one point something. So now, as we deform the PMMA, even though in the immiscible blend there, uh, there isn't uh, much adhesion between them, some of that stress is actually transferred to the uh, uh, polystyrene. We break the droplets, as we saw before in the micrographs. So there is uh, a lot of creation of interface there. There is deformation and breakup of these droplets. So that there is a second shoulder, a small second shoulder in the green curve there, which is the immiscible blend. But as we go to 5, 7.5, 10, 20% of the, of, of the modified polystyrene, now we have stresses uh, that take hundreds of seconds, minutes to relax. So completely different behavior. And in fact, we can take, we can calculate the time it takes for the stress to relax to 2% of its initial value. Arbitrarily 2%. It could be 5, it could be 1, it could be 10. We chose 2. And what we see there is the relaxation times first uh, for the three polymers, PMMA, polystyrene, and uh, uh, the modified polystyrene. Um, and basically, they relax very, uh, very quickly, uh, less than 10 seconds. And then what we see is that above 5% 5 5 of compatibilized polystyrene, we get a very sharp increase in relaxation time. So there is this huge compatibilization effect go, going on. And then it saturates above 12.5%, 10 to 12.5%. It then saturates. As you can see, then there is clearly no more influence. But this uh, figure shows us without, a margin of, with, without any margin for uh, doubt that there is a huge effect, a huge compatibilization effect going on there. And this is uh, also confirmed by the extensional behavior. So here now we have the uh, relaxation after just a very quick uh, uh, step stretch, okay? And again, as you can see, the PMMA, now, now in the previous case in shear, we deformed a lot very slowly. Here we, we deform a little very quickly. Uh, the maximum deformation here is about 30% or 0 0.3 in linear stretch. Whereas in the shear experiment, we had a deformation of 25, which is like 2,500%. So this is a smaller stretch. So what we're trying to do here is by imposing this very quick stretch uh, faster than the relaxation time of the uh, materials, we're hoping to really probe the interface by almost not deforming the uh, dispersed phase and just looking at what happens to the interface. And what we can see there is uh, that the green curve and the black diamonds, which are the immiscible blend and the PMMA, again follow, so we see what we saw before, they again follow the same relaxation. So we're really not doing much in this very fast deformation, we're not doing much to the polystyrene. But then we have the relaxation uh, times of the polystyrene and the modified polystyrene, and again, for simplicity, I only showed here some of the results. The red one 
which is the blend with the 20% uh, polystyrene, so the maximum we used, you can see that at long times, even then, the relaxation is much, is slower than the relaxation of the polystyrene, of the modified polystyrene. So again, we are really probing the uh, interface here. And then the light scattering. So what's happening here? So we used uh, light scattering uh, in these very dilute solutions just to look at, um, at, at, the, uh, uh, at the diffraction patterns. And this is what we see. So what we measure in, this light, uh, uh, in, this light, in these light scattering studies is a pattern. Basically, if there's no orientation in the system, the, the diffraction pattern, as you can see there on the bottom left of the figure, is essentially uh, all these rings, they're concentric and they're circular. So if we uh, plot an anisotropy factor, it's minimum, it's very small. As it becomes, as the drops become elongated, then this pattern def deforms as well, okay? And uh, what we see there is a very, this is for the immiscible blend. What we see there is that we go from an isotropic state, very circular pattern, to a highly elongated pattern, to a pattern that is less elongated. What does that mean? That means we're stretching the sample, the droplet, we're breaking it, and the smaller droplets then relax back to their positions. So that's what we see, everything that, so this is very well known. Uh, uh, we understand this completely. If we use now, if we do the same thing on the compatibilized blend, now things are different. So we start off from an isotropic system, again, a circular uh, pattern. We get some deformation, but not much. And then as we uh, keep deforming, what happens is that the pattern deforms, but deforms in the opposite direction. So it goes from this to this, okay? And then it stays like that even at the end when we stop the flow. So that means, and this is a, 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 a pre-shear, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, a, a step shear of 70 reciprocal seconds, so it's quite significant, over uh, 250 seconds. And what that means is that like like when you have an elastic system, you stretch it, and then when you relax, it goes in the other direction. That's exactly what's happening here. So this is showing, again, confirming that really the compatibilized sample has uh, a lot of elasticity to it. So there's a very, even though, so in the first case, we had a blend of two components. One of them was very elastic. Uh, so it was sort of masking the effects. This one, now we have um, a blend of two polymers that are relatively inelastic or very, that, uh, that don't have very high elasticity, but w that when compatibilized forms, form a, a very elastic interface. So the third case and final one is what happens now if we still maintain the relatively low elasticity, but now we have the type of interactions that we know will lead to a low elasticity interface. So obviously here what we're trying to do is to show that if you have a, 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 a low elasticity system, including at the interface, not much will happen to the relaxation behavior. Is that, is that what's gonna happen? Is that not, well, if I ask this question, then uh, obviously the answer is yes, nothing's gonna happen. But uh, we'll, we'll see that um, in a minute. So now here what we have is a, a blend of a, a, a typical blend that's used in some packaging applications, a polypropylene with an, eth uh, with an ethylene vinyl alcohol uh, copolymer as the uh, dispersed phase. And this is one of those cases where we compatibilize via the addition of ionomers. And we know that these are relatively weak, um, compo uh, this is a relatively weak compatibilization, even one that can be destroyed at high temperatures. So we expect this type of interface, this type of compatibilization to be relatively weak. Again, we do a, a compounding in a twin screw extruder, 
And in this case, we just did uh, blends of 90-10 and 60-40, uh, which uh, have something to do with real systems, uh, with the real systems we were studying at the time. Um, and then we add between 2 and 20 percent of ionomer in weight uh, relatively to the EVOH content, so relatively to the dispersed phase. What we see is, again, if we look at the morphologies, uh, the non-compatibilized uh, blends have very large droplets, as you can see. Uh, the scale in these, in these is not represented, but it's the same for all four. Uh, whereas if we have the compatibilized um, samples, um, now we have much finer morphologies. So 90, 10, 10, again, means 10% uh, uh, of EVOH and 10% of modified EVOH. 40, per, 40 20 means 40%. Uh, uh, actually, there's a, a little mistake there. It's uh, uh, the uh, 20 is not supposed to be 20, but I'm sorry. So... Um, now what we can do is the stress relaxation after steady shear. And again, what we see uh, is that the polypropylene deforms, uh, sorry, uh, relaxes, uh, has a relatively long relaxation time, longest relaxation time of about 100 seconds. The EVOH is a copolymer. So that's why we, when we look at the triangles, uh, there, are, there are these two uh, plateaus or these two relaxation mechanisms, it's one for each of the blocks, for each of the constituents of the uh, copolymer. And then um, we have the non-compatibilized blend 60-40, uh, uh, which is the, the um, uh, green curve again. And then the 60-40-10 and the 60-40-20. 10 and 20 are the relative uh, incorporation contents of the ionomer in the uh, EVOH. That's what they are. Um, and we can see that the green, the red, and the white crosses curves, they all follow the same relaxation kinetics. Okay? What does that mean? It means that it doesn't matter if you've compatibilized it. If you don't compatibilize it, if you compatibilize it a lot, when everything is molten, basically, everything behaves like if it was an immiscible blend because these are, these are ionomers and we know that at high temperatures we break up these uh, physical crosslinks or, or physical uh, clusters and so we, we revert back even though we have the ionomers in there in the molten state we revert back what this means is that we revert it back to the non-compatibilized case so to conclude um, I think this presentation um, clearly showed that one needs to take an integrated look at, um, my, at structure. In this case, we did it via light scattering and uh, electron microscopy, and at a full array of rheological uh, experiments in shear and in extension to try and understand what is the nature of the interface. Is it elastic? Is it not elastic? Is it weak? Is it strong? Uh, if we only use shear rheology or if we only use microscopy, we may be induced in error. So this, this, this again shows how rheology coupled with other techniques and especially extension, extensional rheology is absolutely critical in uh, the, uh, the development of these new materials. Thank you very much, and we will now take questions. Thank you, Joao, for sharing with us that clear description of the importance as well as the complexity of polymer blend structure and dynamics. A recorded version of this webinar will be archived and available through the TA Instruments website. We will now begin the question and answer segment of this webinar. If you haven't already, please submit your questions to the Q&A window. We will do our best to answer as many of these as possible. All right, our questions are coming in, and uh, our first questions relate to some of the stress relaxation <clears throat> experiments, Joao. So for the first one, uh, maybe you can clarify the experimental protocol for the stress relaxation after steady shear. There's a question as to whether that was generated from the small amplitude oscillatory shear or from a stress relaxation experiment. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, that 
uh, particular experiment uh, was a stress relaxation experiment, but after a steady shear of 0 0.1 reciprocal seconds uh, for 250 seconds, so after 25 strain units. The idea here is uh, being that, that um, shear flows are relatively weak. They're not very good at uh, generating interface, so we needed to uh, deform the system significantly before we could get uh, a good relaxation signal. Um, okay. And uh, how does stress relaxation differ between the linear viscoelastic region and the nonlinear region? Uh, well, it uh, uh, differs quite a, quite a lot um, because in the um, linear viscoelastic region, um, essentially you are probing the structure of the material because you're not permanently changing it. Um, in the nonlinear region, uh, the material uh, uh, is not the same that uh, started the experiment. Um, so, for example, in a polymer system, there might have been uh, a, a loss of entanglements, for example, or uh, there, in, the, in the case of blends, um, there might have been some uh, permanent defer deformation of the droplet phase as well. Um, so they are they do give us very different information, although the curves uh, have the same general uh, 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 form because it's still a, uh, uh, an exponentially decreasing curve in time, um, they do give us uh, different insights into the uh, physics of the systems. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and then there's a, a question about the, um, the interpretation of some of the what seem like similar data between the small amplitude oscillatory shear and the stress relaxation. And that is that for some of the highly compatibilized blends, looking at G prime, like the 80, 0, 20, that red curve, um, it looked like it went to a plateau at low frequency, and yet it's Are we talking, sorry, Dave, are we talking about which system are we talking about? The polyamide systems or the, poly, the PMMA systems? The PMMA systems, that second system. Okay. So, yeah. sorry. All right. Uh, carry on, please. Yeah. So, in that case. So, what, uh, what was the question? Yes. Uh, the G prime from the small amplitude oscillatory shear showed a plateau at low frequency, but the stress relaxation did not didn't seem like it reached a plateau. Was that just a difference of the times of those experiments, or uh, a different interpretation there? Um, no, those are just the uh, dif dif differences of the uh, time. So uh, basically, in the small angle oscillatory shear, you see the plateau at very low frequencies, which means long times. And as you can see in the stress relaxation after steady shear, so the next slide, at long times, the uh, relaxation also seems to be plateauing out. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, yes, so basically the, the, the time scales are inverted in one and the other. Okay. okay. And then uh, here's a question about um, different strategies for impacting blends. In blends relaxation, I'm sorry, in blends mm -hmm. relaxation times can be reduced. Can a similar effect be achieved by increasing molecular weight of one of the polymers uh, and leaving out the second one? Um, okay, so I'm not sure if I understand the uh, question uh, completely, and whoever uh, posed the question uh, is quite welcome to send me an email and, and we can discuss it <laughs> further offline. Uh, but uh, typically uh, when we, so we have two issues here. One is um, if I increase the molecular weight of any polymer in principle, I'm going to uh, increase its relaxation time. Uh, it's going to be more elastic, um, higher um, uh, entanglement density, so uh, the uh, relaxation time is going to increase. Now, for the blends, um, we have a completely different, um, or, or we we have an additional re relaxation mechanism. It's just not the relaxation of the two or three phases or whatever. We also have an interface, um, and that's pretty much the idea of this uh, 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 webinar, is that that interface plays all sorts of strange roles, depending on how elastic it is, how strong it is. Um, so by manipulating the uh, interface, yes, absolutely, you can um, manipulate uh, to a certain extent the uh, relaxation behavior and the relaxation times. But typically, keeping everything else 
the same, just using a higher molecular weight grade, for example, of one of the phases will not decrease the uh, relaxation time. Okay. Um, now okay. Coming back to but that. as I said, I mean, I'm not sure if, if I understand the question. So if the person wants to send me an email, um, uh, we can continue this, this uh, uh, question offline. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, also question, one of the curves was labeled interfacial tension. How is the interfacial tension either derived or measured directly? So this is a pen and drop technique. Um, we basically drop one of the phases into the other one. And uh, basically by the uh, droplet shape, by, the, we, by looking at the curvature, we can estimate the uh, interfacial tension. Okay. Um, and there have been a couple questions about different ways to perform the stress relaxation experiment. Specifically, um, could you get similar data if you perform these measurements in tension using, for example, a DMA rather than a rotational rheometer? Um, uh, a DNA? Uh, DMA, oh, oh a DMA. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in principle, that's uh, the the idea is uh, is the same. Yeah. I mean, if you use a DMA and you apply a, a a uh, deformation and then uh, follow the relaxation that there is absolutely no um, there is there there is absolutely nothing to prevent you from doing that okay. um, so yeah I mean D D this would work for DMA obviously the ones after steady shear would not work for DMA right but uh, after a step shear or um, uh, even after some nonlinear oscillation could be done by DMA if it was uh, done close enough to the uh, melting temperature or high enough above the uh, glass transition temperature. So yeah, I mean in principle you could you could do this on uh, solid solid systems with DMAs. Yes. Okay, and then uh, we'll have time for just two more questions. So this question. All right. To what extent can you use supramolecular interactions, for example, hydrogen bonding, uh, to minimize the formation of droplets and therefore maximize that interfacial surface area? Um, to sorry, say say you say again, Dave. So uh, to use uh, supramolecular interactions, and the example is hydrogen yes. bonding, I suppose, as opposed to the covalent bonding strategies that you are using. Mm -hmm. um, how could those be? as opposed to the covalent bonding strategies that you are using. Mm -hmm. um, how could those be used to minimize the formation of droplets and, their, and therefore maximize the interfacial surface area? Um, well, um, the strength of the interactions will uh, then uh, be directly related with uh, the stress transfer between the matrix and the droplet phase, okay? So uh, if you have relatively weak interactions like hydrogen bonding compared, as compared to covalent inter inter interactions, which you'd get from a, uh, a, a reactive extrusion strategy, uh, for, a, for, a, for example, will lead to um, essentially a slightly weaker, um, uh, slight, slightly weaker interactions. Okay, and uh, those interactions would lead to um, uh, worse stress transfer characteristics. So we're really talking about uh, stronger the the stronger the um, uh, droplet, uh, the stronger the interactions on the interface, the easier in principle it is to transfer that stress and to break up the uh, droplets. Okay, now obviously the. the it also depends on the uh, viscosity ratio of the two phases, which one is the, is the, is the uh, most viscous. Um, and that is like Grace showed, the uh, Grace plot showed, um, uh, that, that, that is also a huge effect. So if you want to end up with s smaller droplets, uh, typically you should be working um, with viscosity ratios of around one and uh, well compatibilized um, Polymer blends, yep. Okay, all right, perfect. And then our last question uh, is about monodispersity or polydispersity. The question is, in the systems that you showed, uh, are these polymers monodispersed? And if they are, does the same principle apply to polydispersed systems as well? No, these are all, okay, so these are all commercial materials. So these are all polydispersed. Okay, there you go. Okay, so uh, these are all polydispersed, yes. Okay, perfect.
Well, uh, I'd like to thank you, Joao, one more time, and this concludes today's program. Um, I'd like to thank Joao one more time for joining us today, and I'd especially like to thank our audience for spending some of your day with us today. Uh, this webinar, like all of our TA webinars, will be archived and available through the TA Instruments website. In fact, if you missed the live broadcast of Joao's first webinar on extensional rheology in polymer processing, especially in thermoforming applications, I would suggest that you take some time uh, to view that program as well as it adds to what we covered today. Uh, please look out for future invitations uh, for, uh, from other TA Instruments webinars, and we thank you and uh, wish you all have a great day. Well, thank you very much for having me, Dave. Uh, thanks to the audience for listening. And if anybody uh, has any further questions, they can always contact me directly uh, by email. Okay? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.